Well, it, it is it is a, a real honor to um, uh, introduce uh, Kurt Fields, General U.S. Grant. Uh, as I said to to you before, I've never seen uh, anybody that e even comes close to to uh, presenting uh, 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 General Grant as uh, as uh, Kurt does. And I, uh, honestly, when I spent that day with him at Whitehead. Um, he is a fountain of knowledge. I, I'm not sure there's anybody out there that, that knows more about uh, about Grant than uh, than um, uh, Kurt Fields. So, without any further uh, ado, let me introduce Kurt Fields, General U.S. Grant. Perhaps the telegraph is working now. Is yes. it? Yes. Ah, very good. We're still working on how to operate the, the telegraph in the field. So I understand that glitches and malfunctions can occur. They do not frustrate me. I hope they do not frustrate you. I appreciate you joining me here under the fly uh, in my headquarters in the field near uh, Corinth, Mississippi. Uh, Colonel Rawlins told me that some civilians would be joining me and I'm very pleased to see that you have come indeed. You would like to hear, I understand something about Shiloh and about Fort Donaldson. I'd like to talk to you about Shiloh, but I must needs first go back and tell you a bit about what transpired in that couple of weeks between the victory at Fort Donaldson when Buckner surrendered to me and uh, coming down to Pittsburgh Landing. You see, on February the 16th, the morning of the 16th, Buckner surrendered to me about mid-morning. Uh, I was most gratified, a uh, bit surprised. Uh, they could have held out much longer than they did. Uh, but I was also surprised by a little glitch of protocol. You see, Lou Wallace, uh, who is not a professional soldier, he's a political party, he's a good man, a uh, courageous man. But Lou Wallace was close to the Dover Hotel. And on the morning of the 16th, General Wallace went to the Dover Hotel and uh, went the downstairs in the back of the hotel on a lower floor, which is where we met and talked. Uh, he had breakfast with General Buckner. Now I got there to take the surrender from General Buckner, only to walk in and see General Wallace at breakfast with General Buckner. Uh, I was not nonplussed about this because I, I understand that General Wallace is not knowledgeable in the ways of military protocol. Uh, I was only the commanding general there to take the surrender of the uh, opposing general, and General Wallace had set himself down to enjoy breakfast before the surrender was uh, consummated. So I don't think he'll do that again, but I think that's just in passing, it's interesting to. Uh, know what General Wallace had done. But on the night of the 16th, as I understand, near midnight going into the 17th, Secretary of War Stanton gave President Lincoln, which he'd requested, my nomination to be Major General of Volunteers. Until this point, I'd been Major General of, uh, 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 Brigadier General, rather. But upon the taking of Donaldson, I was promoted to Brigadier General, uh, Major General of Volunteers, and I got the two stars. I was most gratified with that. In the days following Donaldson's fall, there was some confusion because nobody had taken an army in surrender. Uh, the, the protocol and how to accomplish getting those men on boats and north to prisoner of war camps, the officers to a different camp, was something of a logistical problem. And I wanted to go to Nashville because Nashville was just a, a short distance away on the Cumberland River, and it's also a major railhead. The South is using it to great advantage to move men and materiel, and I wanted to go take it. We had a significantly uh, sized army, and there would have been nothing that they could have done to stop us. Sidney Johnston is falling 
to the southeast down through Kentucky, Tennessee, and to the northern border of Mississippi. So he had gone back to Nashville. Now, I think it's interesting to note that I believe it was on the 10th, either the 8th or the 10th of February, that General Johnston had telegraphed President Davis that Fort Donaldson was going to fall. So Sidney Johnston had given up on Donaldson before I had ever invested it. And moreover, to complicate things, he had uh, two men, Floyd and Pillow. Floyd was not a military man at all. He had the makings of one, but he was not a military man. And Pillow had demonstrated his military lack of prowess in the Mexican War. You may recall, he's the man that had his troops in the Mexican War at one time dig the entrenchments on the inside of their breastworks. And I think people are still laughing about that. Certainly, no one has forgotten it. And Pillow, though, was second in command. And they demonstrated their feelings by uh, hasty withdrawal and leaving uh, Simon Buckner in command to surrender. But Sidney Johnston had already advised President Davis that Donaldson was going to fall. And it was the, the keystone to his line of defense running from the Mississippi uh, almost to the Appalachians with Bowling Green north of Fort Donaldson, pretty much in the center of that. And he had to fall back and come down through Middleton, Kentucky, Middle Tennessee to Northern Mississippi. And he was under some severe criticism for that because what he'd done is he'd lost Kentucky, all of Middle Tennessee and West Tennessee without having fired a shot. And it was in some, uh, some hot water with the uh, Confederate Congress and cabinet. So I wanted to get to Nashville and take it before it would be destroyed because I got wind that Colonel Nathan Bedford Forrest, who'd gotten away from me at Donaldson, had gone into, been sent to Nashville to quell the rioting that was going on there and getting the looting of the businesses and of the supply trains that were still in Nashville before they were moved out. And Colonel Forrest did a good job of stopping that. Buell is coming from the east to approach Nashville and he uh, was not quite to Nashville when I got on February the 24th. Now, this is eight days after Donaldson fell. I'm in Clarksville, Tennessee, not far from Donaldson on the Cumberland River. And Bull Nelson comes in, I think with two divisions. And he had been sent before the fall of Donaldson to reinforce me. Well, I sent him on to Nashville just a few miles further and told him to act as you will, we need to secure that city. Buell gets to the north side of the Cumberland River, Nashville's on the south side, as it bends, the Cumberland bends through the city and was not going into Nashville. Now, you should be aware that Buell in command of the Army of the Ohio and in his district on that side of the river would not cross the river to go into Nashville to take the surrender of the mayor and board of aldermen. Because had he done that, when he stepped on the south side of the river, he'd have been under my command. He would have been in my district. And he refused to do that. So the mayor of Nashville and the Board of Aldermen, they've thrown up their hands at the fall of Donaldson and said, we give up, we give, we surrender, we don't, don't destroy the city. So Buell won't come across the river. Bull Nelson has come in from Clarksville and occupied the city. They said, you can have it. And, and this disturbed General Buell. He was demanding who ordered that. I remained silent about the issue. Uh, but Buell had the mayor and board of aldermen row across the Cumberland River to Edgefield, Tennessee, to surrender. He wouldn't come to my side, so to speak, of the river. But I have been in contact with General Halleck in St. Louis via 
the southernmost part of the telegraph line in Cairo, Illinois. I'm sending my uh, messages to Cairo and they're being telegraphed to St. Louis. And I was telling General Hallett that I wanted to go to Nashville and hearing no orders to the contrary that I was going to go into Nashville, which was within my district. My district limits were not really defined, but they went at least to the Cumberland River. So I didn't get any orders from General Hallett not to go into Nashville. So on uh, February the 28th, I went into Nashville. And I spent the day there looking for General Buell. I sent messages to contact him. And by the end of the day, when I was boarding the boat to go back to Clarksville, here comes General Buell. And uh, we talked briefly. And I told him, come across the river, take Nashville and take those rail yards before Bedford Forest destroys them all. And he said, I can't do it don't you hear the combat going on? And I said, General Buell, that's not combat. Those are ammunition explosions. They're setting fire to what they can't take with them, what Forrest can't take with him. It's, it's, there's not a battle. And uh, he still declined. And uh, only much later went into Nashville. I went back to Clarksville. Well, when I got back to Clarksville, another day or so, I am uh, taken the task by General Halleck. And he sends me a very angry telegram, several, demanding, why have you not reported your strength daily as I have requested? Why have you not given me your daily reports as I have repeatedly requested? In fact, I have messages from Washington City that say to place you under arrest for the good of the service, to court-martial you. I've been told to court-martial you. And he, I found out later, has telegraphed General McClellan and, uh, in Cincinnati at this time and tells him Grant has fallen into his old habits, indicating that I'm in the bottle and drunk, which is not the case. McClellan telegraphed back to Halleck and said, if you feel it necessary, arrest him and charge him appropriately for the good of the service. So uh, Halleck has my court-martial papers drawn up. On March the 4th, Halleck telegraphed me and said, place General Charles Ferguson Smith in command of the Army of the Tennessee and send them upriver uh, to the Pittsburgh Landing area, Eastport, Mississippi, which is just south of Pittsburgh Landing on an expedition, you will remain yourself uh, in Clarksville. And I was in Clarksville and Fort Hyman. So I was thinking, uh, I'm very disturbed about this because in the week following February the 16th, I have been on every headline of every newspaper virtually in the country, and I'm lauded as the new national hero. I have won the first significant battle of the war. Mill Springs was won by George Thomas before that, but Fort Donaldson had eclipsed even that. I've taken an entire rebel army out of the field. 18% of the artillery of the Confederate Army fell with Buckner at Fort Donaldson. I've been a hero, and now within just a couple of weeks, I'm being discussed by the two commanding generals, Halleck and McClellan, to court-martial me. Now, Halleck was uh, uh, doing things behind the scenes that's beginning to come to light to me, but I still don't believe that. I Surely, uh, Henry Wager Halleck would not be as vindictive and vicious as what people are telling me uh, that he's been doing. I, I, I don't believe that. There are no two men I'd rather serve under than uh, George McClellan and Henry Halleck. But... I found out also at this time that a rebel telegrapher had gotten between Cairo and St. Louis, and he was intercepting all of my messages, all of messages, but mine particularly, and either altering the information or deleting information and then sending them on. 
Now we found out about that. He skedaddled. And as far as I know, he is still active in the field in rebel telegraphy. He, he's an expert. He's able to forge telegrapher signals. Everybody has a different, I understand, uh, tap and rhythm. This man can imitate anybody. So he, he sounds like he's the person that you think you're re from whom you're receiving a message. But he was tampering with my information because I told Halleck uh, rather angrily. I said, I've been reporting and, and giving you everything you've asked for on a daily basis. So I'm under virtual house arrest. Charles Ferguson Smith takes what was my army, the Army of the Tennessee, to Savannah, Tennessee and Pittsburgh Landing. Well, about that time, Elihu Washburn, who was my congressman from Galena, Illinois, and a longtime good friend of President Lincoln, gets wind that I'm in difficulties and facing court martial. He went to President Lincoln and told him what he had heard. And President Lincoln was alarmed. And he said, General, I can't, that's the, one of the first things that President, or it's the first thing President Lincoln said about me that I cherish. I can't spare this man, he fights. So President Lincoln had Secretary of War Stanton tell Adjutant General Alonzo Cooper to send the telegram to Henry Halleck in St. Louis and it's, I think it's unique and, and interesting that President Lincoln worded it in this manner. He said, I want to know exactly what General Grant did, exactly when he did it, and exactly where he did it. Upon receiving that information from uh, the Secretary of War, well, the Adjutant General from the Secretary of War from the President, Henry Halleck said, oh no, that's all a rumor. That's all a vicious rumor. As he pushed the drawer shut on my already completed court martial papers, he said that I've, I've determined that's all a vicious rumor. General Grant has been acting in good faith and I'm restoring him to command. And on March the 13th, he sent me a telegram restoring me to command and said, I look forward to enjoying more victories with you in the future with the Army of the Tennessee. I was greatly relieved. March 15th, I'm on the riverboat going upriver. Uh, and and I, I want to stress, when you look at your map at the Tennessee River, the Tennessee River is the only river in America that crosses the same state twice. It completely traverses Tennessee. And in the eastern part of the state, it's flowing south. It goes to the west and near Corinth, Mississippi, it cuts a sharp turn and flows north. And it completely divides Tennessee into three mountains, plateau and rolling hills and delta, three distinctly different geographical features, all of which played in my efforts here in Tennessee. But when I'm going to Pittsburgh Landing, even though I'm going south, I'm going up river because I'm going against the current. It took a while to get there. On March the 17th, I got to Savannah, Tennessee, a village there, and on the bank of the river, the east bank of the uh, Tennessee River. And I met with General Charles Ferguson Smith. Now, I should like to point out too, that General Smith was my commandant of cadets when I was a cadet at West Point from 39 to 43. And I've been very sensitive about this man. He's about six feet, three inches tall, skinny as a rail. He looks like a grasshopper unfolding when he stands. Big, bushy, white mustache, career army to the bone. Very effective man. Saved the day at Fort Donaldson. But I have had a conversation with him and told him I'm very sensitive to giving orders to my old commandant of cadets. And he told me in his inimitable manner, uh, don't worry about it, Grant. I'm a professional soldier and so are you. And you do as you must. Give me the orders you will. I have no, I harbor no resentment. And he didn't. But when he had gotten to Pittsburgh Landing, Sherman tried to burn the bridges at Eastport south of 
uh, Pittsburgh landing and the, and the river was up with heavy rains from the spring. He couldn't do it. So he comes back and set up the camp at Pittsburgh landing. One of those days there before I got to Pittsburgh landing, General Smith had stepped from one boat to another and had slipped as boats are wont to do when he stepped to the other boat, the boat he was on pushed back and he ground his shin from the ankle all the way up to his knee to the bone. And he was in terrible pain, it's become badly infected. And I don't expect him to survive this. Well, he, and indeed he died on April 25th. But when I got to him, he told me what he'd done. Now, half of the army is around Savannah, Tennessee, which is eight miles north upriver from Pittsburgh Landing. And the other half of the army is around Pittsburgh Landing. I wanted to get them and began moving to get them all to Shiloh, to Pittsburgh Landing. And uh, overall, it took 175 steamboats to move the armies from Savannah and the other ones coming in from the Midwest. I had about 33,000 men, 35,000 men on the ground at Pittsburgh Landing in, uh, between March the 17th and April the 1st. Now, when I've got word though that Buell is coming from Nashville, Columbia, Tennessee, just south of Nashville with the Army of the Ohio, he's got about 40,000. Bull Nelson got to me first, and I sent him down the east bank of the river just across from Pittsburgh Landing to camp there and stay there. I've got General Wallace, Lou Wallace, and Buell's got about 6,000 men. Lou Wallace has got about 5,500, and I've got him at Crump's Landing just a little bit up from Pittsburgh Landing, and that is our supply depot. And indeed, I kept him there because indeed, I felt that if I was going to be attacked, it would be there to destroy our supplies. But I had Wallace build, there was a river road running beside the river, and I had Wallace build another river road or another road out from the river coming across Owl Creek on what became our right as we're facing west. So there were two roads to get to Pittsburgh Landing from Crump, uh, Crump, Tennessee, Crump's Landing. And Bull Nelson is across the river with 5,500, 6,000 men. Buell is en route from Columbia, Tennessee, 85 miles. But Buell's dragging his sword. He's repairing the railroads and corduroying the roads and, and doing all this construction en route instead of quick marching, force marching to get to me. He had no sense of urgency. I didn't think that Albert Sidney Johnston would leave Corinth and move 20 miles north and attack me because Johnston has gotten about 40,000 men there at Corinth, Mississippi. And he's heavily entrenched. Now, military thinking is that if you're going to attack an entrenched position, it takes at least three men for every one man inside the works, if you have hopes of carrying it. And I've got about 40,000 men total, a little bit more. And I didn't think that Johnston would leave security and come give me battle in the open. I found out though that Johnston had a different agenda than mine, but more about that in a moment. When I got to Pittsburgh Landing, I didn't do two things. I did not entrench and I did not build breastworks because uh, James Bird C. McPherson, Lieutenant Colonel at that time, West Point graduate and uh, uh, a favorite of mine. I really think a lot of him. He's the engineer for the Army of the Tennessee and he told me there's no need to entrench because if you do that, the trenches are going to have to be closer to the river. The camps are west of where the entrenchments would be. Now, about three miles out from the river, 
is what became the center of our line, the old Shiloh Log Meeting House. Sherman had his headquarters there with McClernand to his left and Hurlbut behind him and Colonel Stewart anchoring on the river, the Tennessee River. And it, McPherson advised me and I rode the ground and agreed. If we dig trenches, they're gonna to have to be behind the troops. Now, Pittsburgh Landing is heavily wooded with some plunging gullies and creeks, Snake Creek, Lick Creek, Owl Creek, but most of it, most of the area is level and flat with indeed natural drill and parade grounds. So they were beyond what would have been where the, the trenches were. So I didn't dig trenches. I didn't build breastworks because I felt that with the exception of about three divisions of all of that army, most of those men coming there had never seen the elephant. Indeed, most of them had only gotten their weapons on those riverboats coming down the river from the Midwest. And I felt that my soldiers needed more time with the manual of arms rather than with the spade and the pick and the shovel. But another reason one must be aware of, the war is only 11 months old. By the 1st of April, you know, April the, the 12th when it started, we're 51 weeks into the war, 50 weeks into the war. And people were still of the mind. See, Shiloh had not yet happened. And people were still of the mind that real men stand and meet their enemy and receive fire. Real men, a real soldier doesn't hide behind a tree or indeed dig a hole. No, sir. Real men don't do that. But this is, this is thinking by men who have not seen combat. And I'm thinking that Albert Sidney Johnston's not going to leave a protected position to hit me in the open. And if I had built breastworks, if I had dug trenches, my troops, it would have hurt morale because my troops would have felt I was showing the white feather. They would have said, what is this? In fact, General Tuttle said, if I had these entrenchments on that battlefield or on those grounds would have caused a person suggesting it to be laughed out of camp. So I didn't entrench and I didn't build breastworks. I was drilling those men. Now, the, and, and Buell is coming. He's always coming. He expected to get there on the night of the 5th. I gave him orders to come see me upon meeting, uh, getting to Savannah, because I've at my headquarters at the Cherry Mansion in Savannah. It's about 45 minutes or so to an hour or so up river because you got to go against the current to get to Pittsburgh Landing. I had a good man on the field. William Tecumseh Sherman's in command on the field. I had no concerns about that. And I wanted to, to meet Buell and speak with him as soon as he arrived at Savannah for displacement of troops and positioning of troops. So I'm waiting there at night. I stay at the uh, landing every day as late as I can. And then I come back to the, the uh, Cherry Mansion. On the night of Friday, April the 4th, it's been raining now for about three or four days. Real stick floaters, maybe two sticks, torrential downpours. And that was to my advantage and advantage because it was slowing down, I found out afterward, Sidney Johnston. But on the night of the 4th, we had gone to the, the landing to return, and I got word that there was something happening to the west out by Sherman's headquarters around the log meeting house. And I turned my party road back. Well, uh, Sherman and McPherson met us before I got back to Sherman's headquarters, and he said, there's nothing to this. I don't anticipate anything like an attack you may return to headquarters, General, and I did. Now, it was so dark. It was one of those nights without the pouring rain, torrential rain, you could not see your hand in front of your face. 
I had to trust my horse for his step. And I was riding Fox. I like, I've got Fox and I've got old Jack. Jack's my rocking chair. I really, he's got such a smooth ride, but Fox is a good animal too. Well, Fox stumbled. He lost his footing and fell on his left side and caught my left leg under him. Now, they got the horse off of me and got me on the boat there at the landing, and my surgeon quickly checked me, and he said, if it hadn't been raining so hard and the ground so soft, this would have crushed your leg and your hip, and that would have proved a fatal injury. So the rain was good for me in the sense it didn't break or crush a leg, at the same time, Sidney Johnson has left Corinth on the, the uh, 3rd of April, and what should have taken him two days is taking him four, almost five days to get there, because he's having to pull 44,000 men and artillery through those roads that quickly became soupy mud in a morass. Well, they got me back to Cherry Mansion within an hour, and my left leg and foot was so swollen, they had to cut off my boot. And I was in agony and I was on a crutch. That's why you see me with my crutch. So I was on a crutch and had to be lifted onto my horse and off my horse to even ride. Also on April the 1st, we had had a heavy demonstration of rebel cavalry in our front. So it, the question is thrown up, I w was I surprised at Shiloh? No, sir. I was not surprised at Shiloh. I knew Johnston was out there. I thought it was a reconnaissance in force. We knew that they were out there in, in some numbers, but not the entire Confederate Army. I thought that if Johnston was going to hit me, and remember, I'm waiting on Buell. I've got Johnston to my south and my west, I've got Buell coming from my east, and I'm, I'm waiting. Who's going to get there first? So I'm thinking that Johnston was going to hit me if I don't get Buell on the 9th, maybe on the 8th, but not on the 6th. And <clears throat> he's moving to get to me. They're firing off shots. And see, his army is as green as mine. You got soldiers who still think they're on a lark popping their rifles at squirrels, bands playing, just a lark, and they're not trying to be quiet. So my troops are hearing something out there. So we, we know they're out there. And on the morning of the 6th, I had hobbled down the steps from my bedroom upstairs at the Cherry Mansion upstairs on the back facing the front of the house because the back of the house faces the river uh, and was having breakfast with my staff. And I heard that artillery about seven o'clock and I put my coffee cup down and I said, gentlemen, the ball is in motion. And I, we went out on the porch. I was down to the, uh, I was carried down to the boats, got on uh, board, Captain Shirk, uh, uh, Gwen rather took us on down, the Tigers down to the, the landing. And I got there about between eight and 8.30. Battle was already fully invested. Now the, the Rebs had hit us in three waves, three miles long, about 1500 yards apart. They had 44,000 men. And I've got about 35,000 by now on the ground. Now I've got Nelson across the river, I've got Lou Wallace up at Crump's Landing, and I found out that Buell had gotten there the night of the 5th, but he had not deigned to come by and meet with me as he'd been ordered. And he got there later in the day. As soon as I got there, I did two things. I immediately ordered ammunition sent to every unit in the field and keep a steady supply of ammunition. I, I had learned that from my quartermaster days. I also sent Captain Baxter, my quartermaster director, with orders, verbal orders, to go to uh, General Wallace and tell him, get here as soon as you can. I had passed Wallace in my boat, went close to his, and I said, come by the nearest road if I call for you. 
Captain Baxter said he wanted the orders uh, in writing, and I said, well, write it out. So he wrote a memo out about being ordered, and, and that has, that's been lost. But at one o'clock that afternoon, I again sent messengers, uh, Colonel Rowley and uh, Captain Webster, Colonel Webster, to go and find Wallace and tell him, hurry up, I need you. I could have used that 5,500 men. And they found him actually marching the long roundabout road that they built. And when they told him to get there as soon as possible, he countermarched and went back to Crunch Landing and came down the river road. So he didn't get there until the fighting had stopped for the day, at the end of the day. Uh, but we, and during that day, I was with uh, Colonel Webster and Colonel McPherson, and we crossed an open field. Didn't look like there was anything there, nothing happening in the, the copse of woods across the field. So we brought our animals out across the field. Well, the woods lit up with rebel fire. We put the spurs to our horses and got into the safety of the woods across the opening. Colonel Webster had lost his hat. He did not go back to get it. Colonel McPherson had been, his horse was breathing in a labored manner, and we saw that his horse had been shot through and through behind McPherson's legs, and the horse within a matter of minutes dropped dead. And I had taken a hit. My saber had been hit by apparently a spent mini ball and hit it just below the pommel. And in fact, it was hanging only by a mere shard of metal. And then so the blade and the scabbard indeed fell away by the end of the day. At the end of the night, at the end of the day, end of the night, I only had the, the handle of my sword. And I haven't worn one since. I don't like to wear a sword. They just bruised my leg and bothered the horse. But we had taken some fire that day. One of my aides had had his head taken off by a cannonball. See, see uh, on his horse immediately next to me. In fact, his blood and brain spattered all over me. I had gone to every commanding officer on that field and back again all day long. I was constantly moving. I got back to the landing and had a talk with General Buell, and he is very disturbed at the four or 5,000 men that were under the bluffs and threatening to shoot them, hitting them with the flat of his sword. And I said, they'll, they'll be all right. They're just scared. They're good young men. Once they get over being scared, they're going to be as good a soldier as you could want, General. But he failed to see that. I don't think General Buell ever distinguished between the type of man who's a regular soldier and, and a volunteer. Uh, but he, was, he began moving his troops over when the night began to fall. So at, at dark, Colonel Webster had set up a last line of defense and Beauregard had, oh, I got 20,000 men across the river uh, with Buell and the, then I, we got Bull Nelson's men over as well. So I started the day of the 7th with as many or more than I had started the 6th. Beauregard, I found out by now that Johnston is dead. Beauregard has got no reinforcements. We've lost nearly 8,000 killed and wounded that first day, and so has Beauregard, commensurate losses, although his were greater than ours. About midnight, the rain has started again. It hasn't rained all day. It was a beautiful spring day on April the 6th and uh, cold, very chilly, as it is wont to be there in Middle Tennessee, a uh, southern Middle Tennessee. And I had gone back into the Pitt Brothers trading post there under the bluff there on Pittsburgh Landing, which is how it gets its name, the Pitt Brothers, Pittsburgh. It's a joke on the Pittsburgh up north. And uh, they had commandeered it for a hospital and they were sawing off arms and legs and hurling them out the windows, the screaming, the agony, the horror that was in that room. So I felt 
it would be better to subject myself to the elements than to witness that horror. Walked back outside, got a great coat, and was try sitting under a, a tree trying to keep this cigar lit, and a wet cigar doesn't smoke well, and Sherman materialized. And he said, well, Grant, he always talked to me like that. That's just the way Sherman talks. We've had the devil's own day today, haven't we? And I said, yeah. Lick them tomorrow, though. Sherman cleared his throat and said, uh, I, I expect I should get back to my command. And I said, best you do. Because as I told you at Donaldson, there's a time in every battle when each side thinks it's whipped. And it's at that point that the side that hits first will carry the day. And Beauregard is going to have to get up mighty early in the morning to hit me before I hit him. Have your men sleep on their arms. And at first light, as soon as they can see heavy skirmish lines out, the divisions are to follow them. And as soon as they engage the enemy, engage him and fight him, which is what we did. They're really, the Battle of Shiloh was really two, two different battles. The first day was more ferocious, if, if anything, than the second day. The Confederates hurled themselves at our positions with no apparent regard for their own safety or well-being. I've never seen such courage, such ferocity. The second day was the reverse of the first. They had fallen back from where they had pushed us, back about a mile to the, the old log house, meeting house. That's where we found the bulk of Beauregard's line and pushed them back. So day two, the seventh was a reversal of day one. By the end of the day, I understand that one of General Beauregard's, about four o'clock in the afternoon, one of General Beauregard's command staff said, General, do you not see our army much like a sugar cube that someone's dropped some water on it? It is holding its shape, but it is melting away. Do you not think it time to order a retreat? Beauregard thought about it. He is not a precipitate man, very sharp man, a good combat commander. And he said, yes, have them pull back. They pulled back in a very orderly retreat. He had Nathan uh, Bedford Forrest, Colonel Forrest, uh, fighting his rear guard. I sent Sherman out to probe to be sure that it was not simply a reorganization for a counterattack. And uh, in a little wooded open field area called Fallen Timbers, Sherman ran into Forrest. So Sherman and Forrest were on the same field inside of each other. I'm told that Colonel Forrest raised his pistol and fired at General Sherman, and the hammer fell on an empty chamber. Now, if that story is not true, it's certainly a good story. It ought to be. So Sherman realized that it was not reorganizing for a counterattack, and he withdrew. Now, I was severely criticized about not pursuing, but I did not pursue because our men were exhausted, as, was the, as were the Confederates. But uh, General Sherman articulated, I think, best. He said, we'd had two days of their Southern hospitality, and we felt if they would leave us alone, we would leave them alone. Also, even though I was commanding the Army, I'd only been that way for a few weeks. I didn't feel appropriate to order Buell's army, as tired as they were, to step in and order them in pursuit of Beauregard. Now, they fell back and withdrew to Corinth. On April the 11th, General Halleck appeared and took overall command. Things were not good for me with that because there were a lot of people calling for my head. When the numbers came back from Shiloh, the country went to her knees. Shiloh's casualties 
in two days in 36 hours of combat from five in the morning on April the 6th to five in the afternoon on April the 7th. There were 23,746 killed and wounded. Now that is 4,000 men dead on the field. 4,000 men dead in 36 hours. Now, perhaps someone who kept, keeps up with such numbers told me, perhaps you are aware of my friends, that that's more men, that 23,746 in those 36 hours are more men killed and wounded than in all of the previous wars our country has been in combined. The revolution, 1812, and the Mexican War because in those three wars, taking several years total, there were 23,215 killed and wounded in three wars. On the fields at Pittsburgh Landing, there were 23,746, 500 and what, some 50 men, more. The horror had, was unimaginable. And because of the makeup of the armies being all volunteer, you had every social strata, every educational level, and therefore the casualty list cut through every level of society. 40% of the households in America, and that's from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from Mexico to Canada, four out of every 10 households in America had somebody killed or wounded at Charlotte. The, it was, no one could have comprehended how, how horrific this was. Casualty lists were, were just unbelievable. There was much weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And of course the cries, somebody's responsible for this. President Lincoln said again, I can't spare this man, he fights. And he knew that the casualty numbers came from 100,000 men fighting over 30 square miles of territory. That's why you've got 23,746 casualties. It wasn't failure on the part of the command, but he did send Halleck down. And General Halleck promptly reorganizes the army into three columns. He put George Thomas with the Army of the Tennessee, my army, for a right column, uh, McClernand, uh, is in command of the reserves and Lew Wallace's troops, and uh, Cook is in command of the Army of the Ohio with the left column. I don't have any command. I've got a title, but I don't have an army to command. So it was there that I, I after several weeks, well, I wrote Julia a letter. I said, I might as well be at the furthest reaches of my command to do the good I'm doing, I'm going to resign. I offered three times to resign, requested a resignation. Halleck wouldn't hear of it, but he wouldn't. You see, he remembered Fort Donaldson when he was going to court martial me, and he, he, he was called in that. He wasn't going to make that mistake again. He simply removed me from any effective command. And I moved my headquarters. Sherman found out I was going to resign and said, just request a change of headquarters. And I went to Memphis, some 75 miles away, and stayed there until July the 10th, when I got a, a telegram from General Halleck, report immediately to Corinth. And I, I said, and that's all he said. Do, do I need to bring my command staff? Do, what do I need to bring? He said, you may bring whom you wish. And that's all he said. When I got there on the 12th, I found out that he'd been named general in chief and was moving to Washington City. And I'm back in command of the Army of the Tennessee. And he left with no explanation. In fact, he didn't tell me that he was going to take the command of the Army of the, Ten of the general in chief position. He said nothing to me. And he left on the morning of the 15th, which brings us to today on July the 15th, outside of Corinth, Mississippi. So that is 
the roller coaster ride that I have gone over through around and under since February the 16th when Buckner surrendered to me, nearly being court-martialed, out of command, back in command, horrific battle fought, won the battle. One final thing I should like to say, I understand General Buell is saying that he saved the Army of the Tennessee on the second day at Shiloh. Now, I will leave it to you to decide whether that's the matter or not, because we got one regiment of the Army of the Ohio across that river by nightfall when all fighting stopped. One regiment had gotten across. And there were two men killed and one man wounded. So at the end of April the 6th, the Army of the Ohio had suffered three casualties, two killed, one wounded, three casualties. The Army of the Tennessee had suffered nearly 8,000. So I leave it to you to determine if the Army of the Ohio and General Buell saved the Army of the Tennessee on the second day. But now I should like to entertain any questions that any of you may have of me. Are there any? Yes, uh, uh, thank you, General. There, there are, are a couple. Uh, when after Donaldson fell, I, that and and with uh, Sherman sure and Grant moving down the Mississippi, I mean, didn't that really open up Western Kentucky? Yes, it did because from then. Well, we were moving on the Tennessee and the Cumberland. We weren't yet on the Mississippi because remember Memphis didn't fall until June the sixth. So we're still away from going further south in Cairo, Illinois. And uh, yes, it, yes, it's pronounced Cairo, not Cairo, as one would think. Uh, but we were on the Tennessee and the Cumberland. Now, I'd like to point out that the fall of Henry and, and uh, Donaldson, the Tennessee and the Cumberland, were like a sword in the belly of the South, the, the Tennessee, and the Cumberland was like a dagger in the heart of the South because Tennessee was on the Cumberland River. It's a major, major railroad depot for the Southeastern Theater of the War, Southwestern, I should say, Theater of the War. And uh, it was a tremendous strategic benefit to get Nashville, Tennessee. First Confederate capital fell and so far it hasn't been taken back. The Tennessee River transverses Tennessee along that southern border, northern Mississippi border and nor northern Alabama and cuts back up into Chattanooga. So we were able to take ironclads. Admiral Foote was able to take ironclads as far as Bridgeport, Alabama. And so we've got tremendous navigational benefit to move the Navy and troops and materiel. So it was, it was tremendous uh, significance for us to get those two rivers. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Um, General, uh, after the Battle of Shiloh, have you ever, uh, did you ever go back? To Shiloh? Just to, just to walk around or something? No, haven't been back. Once I, left Shiloh, once I left Shiloh, I was moving on and, and never looked back. Now, let me point out something. <laughs> Let me point out something. The, the, real, the reason Shiloh was fought was the crossroads at Corinth, Mississippi, where the Mobile and Ohio Railroad from, the, from Mobile, Alabama, the deep water port on the Gulf of Mexico, went to Columbus, Kentucky on the Mississippi some hundred miles or so north of Memphis. It was the major railroad in the southeastern United States connecting the Gulf deep water shipping with the Mississippi and the Midwest. Uh, the, the Memphis and Ohio, or Memphis and Charleston, runs from Memphis, Tennessee to Charleston, South Carolina, and connects the Mississippi with the Atlantic. So manufacturers and agriculturalists can send their goods and produce down to Memphis 
and cut straight across to Charleston and then to England and Northern Europe without having to go down to the Gulf into Southern Europe and even indeed Northern Europe and go on into South America. So those railroads crossed at Corinth. Corinth is a muddy little village of 1500 people full of mosquitoes and bad water. Even the horses won't drink the water. But because those two railroads crossed there in 1859, Memphis and Charleston was completed only in 59. Those two railroads made it the most important real estate in America. We were going to take the crossroads and Johnston was protecting the crossroads. See Shiloh, while I have said is the least understood or perhaps the most persistently misunderstood battle in the entire war, and it is. But Shiloh, remember, if you take nothing else from our visit tonight, re remember, Shiloh is the tail that wags the dog. Because there were four battles in that Crossroads campaign. There was Shiloh, Iuka, Corinth, and Davis Bridge, the Battle of the Hatchie River. And in those four battles, some 10,000 men were killed and about 50,000 wounded. Shiloh, Iuka, Corinth, and Davis Bridge on the Hatchie River. Four battles were fought to secure our control of the crossroads. So keep that in mind. That, that is what I most, I think most want you to remember about our visit tonight. Because so many people do not associate Iuka and Corinth and Davis Bridge with Shiloh. And see, Shiloh should never have been fought. Johnston should have waited. Military thinking would say, Johnston would wait for me to attack him. But Johnston was smarting because like the question was asked, what about losing Kentucky, losing Tennessee? The yelling for replace him. He had a bruised ego. He had to prove he was worthy of those five stars. So he wasn't going to wait for me. He was going to demonstrate battle prowess. Moreover, he wasn't going to sit in Corinth, even behind heavy entrenchments, with 44,000 men, while I got nearly 100,000 by the time I got the Cumberland and the Ohio and the Tennessee Rivers together and moved on Corinth like a juvenile. Okay. Um, two more short ones here. Um, who was the commanding officer that you feel performed exceptionally well and worthy of your recognition? Sherman. Sherman, without a doubt. Yeah. Sherman. Okay. Uh, another question here. Um, how did the Hornets Nest help the Union on the first day? Ask what? How did the Hornet's Nest help the Union troops on the first day? I didn't hear the first. I got the Union troops on the first day. What was the first part of the question, though, Steve? Uh, Mike? Um, how did the Hornet's how Nest? Did the, how did the Hornet's oh, Nest? The Hornet's Nest. Ah, excellent, excellent, and a great question to end. Uh, WHL, I, I should like you to remember, too. The W.H.L. Wallace uh, was in command of that uh, division, and he was shot in the head on the first day with a wound that proved mortal. And uh, in fact, his wife had come down unannounced to visit with him, and she arrived on the morning of the 6th and immediately was pressed into service, volunteered to serve as a nurse for the wounded. He was uh, assumed dead. We found him that night or the next day. He was still alive. He managed to live, I think, Wallace lived three days. He never regained consciousness. His wife did say that when she talked to him, he was able to squeeze her hand. Uh, and then he died. But he was left for dead or assumed dead. And as the rebels were coming across that field there with Ruggles Battery, it's an, a, a large open field and woods line an old, they call it the sunken road. Prentice 
fell back in those woods and set up a defensive position. And the Confederates had to charge across that field. And some say they made five charges, some seven, some say 13 charges across open ground. Ruggles said, I want every gun that you can bring. Now, there were a total of 178 guns at Shiloh. But Ruggles got, depending upon who you talk to, 70 guns, give or take a few, and fired all day. And at the end of the day, they finally were able to take the hornet's nest. Now, the mistake, the two mistakes made were, that, and this was early in the war, this would not have been done. Indeed, it was not demonstrated later in the war that I can think of an instance. As soon as troops got up, Bragg was sending troops up. As soon as they got to Ruggles Battery, they were sent piecemeal across the field instead of waiting for a, a large body of troops to go across the field. And they were being defeated in detail. Finally, toward the end of the day, uh, as I recall, about four o'clock or so, it, it varies anywhere from two to 430. As I recall, I was there at four o'clock and Prentice had no idea of a surrender at that time. And then I moved on to help set up the last line of defense. But about four, 430, Prentice surrendered some 2,500 men. Now that enabled us to have the time to set up the last line of defense. All right. So it, it, in essence, if you're going to say anything, save the army, you could say that. I have no argument with that. It was a heroic effort on the part of those 2,500 men. But remember, it was WHL Wallace's command. Prentice was the man in actual command. So both men should share in the honor that goes with that. The other mistake, though, that I wanted to say, I want to emphasize is what the Confederates should have done. And later in the war, they, they did do this. They would have encapsulated and enclosed the hornet's nest and gone around and moved on to push our forces back to the river. But the war, remember, on April the 6th, is only 51 weeks old. And people hadn't learned what they were about yet. So piecemeal attacks over time, not encapsulating, holding in place, and going around the hornet's nest. Uh, those are two mistakes that were not repeated in the rest of the war. We all made mistakes that early that Sherman, in fact, has written since then that we made mistakes early in the war that had we made them later in the war, we would have been court-martialed out of the service. Yeah. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, that was excellent. We certainly appreciate it. And uh, I'll be getting in touch with you this week, and we'll uh, we'll uh, confirm uh, your your next um, visit to us. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for uh, doing the Zoom program, uh, and uh, I'll send you an email if you would. So if you could send me back your mailing address, that'd be great. But uh, I hope you uh, stay well, stay safe, and uh, we will see you soon. Mike, before you go, advise your membership that if they should like to contact me on the telegraph, I'd be happy to talk with them, and I answer. I do answer my mail. We will do that. We will do that for sure. Thank you.